Father, we come to thy presence, thanking you for this wonderful privilege in our lives where uh, we could come together and discuss about your word and to strengthen our faith so that we may be rooted and grounded in the love of your son, Jesus Christ, and in your love, O oh Lord. Lord, as Sachin, Pastor Sachin is going to lead us and teach us about the life and ministry of Apostle Paul now, we pray that your grace may be granted him, your special anointing may be upon him, Lord, so that we may be able to hear your words and uh, we may be inspired by the life of Paul and open our hearts, Lord, to the revelation you wanted to grant to us and uh, with your spirit grant us the illumination. And the time we spend, Lord, may be acceptable in your sight and our discussions may be fruitful and mutually edifying us, Lord. Thank you very much for listening to us. We ask you to lead us and guide us throughout our Bible study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Praveen. I'll quickly share my screen. My screen is visible, yeah? Okay. Very good evening to everyone. It's uh, again my pleasure to come before you and share what we are learning and then learning together uh, with your inputs and waiting on God and through the Holy Spirit how he is leading all of us. So it's an amazing thing. And today uh, I want in our today's session, we would be looking into the life of Apostle Paul, you know, uh, and I specifically write Paul because it's a journey we'll take to know Paul uh, and know uh, how he turns into Apostle Paul. Yeah. So <laughs> without much ado, let's start. So, okay, beside Peter, the most prominent leader in the early church was Paul, a man from the Greek city of Tarsus, you know, his conversion was the, is a cornerstone in Acts, where Luke described the event three times, once in Acts chapter 9, later in chapter 21, and then chapter 26. Now, through his vision on the Damascus road, Paul becomes a witness to Christ's resurrection. And he is an apostle with a special commission to proclaim the gospel among the Gentiles. From both the book of Acts and Paul's letters, we can develop his life and teaching. Now, Peter describes Paul as a dear brother who wrote many epistles of letters. Now, echoes of Apostle Paul's teaching can be heard in the other New Testament letters such as 1 Peter and Hebrews and the leaders of the post-apostolic church recounts many of the traditions surrounding his life including the uh, martyrdom in Rome under Emperor Nero. Now, Paul's influence on theology uh, has been enormous. He offer the clearest and most detailed exposition of the Christian faith. Paul has roots in three worlds, Greco-Roman culture, Jewish culture, and the Christian culture. Now, each of these affected his letters and provide some background for what he writes. Now, although he worked hard and suffered severely for the gospel, he refused to seek honor for himself since he knew that his efforts were divinely empowered. And he says, to this end, I strenuously contend with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. As we read in Colossians chapter 1 verse 29. Now to understand the shape and history of the early Christ Christianity, we must explore the life and teaching of Paul. Now let's move towards his background. Now let's see first the naming convention. Now I'll tell you something. In, in Maharashtra, 
or mostly in the north, we have three names for a person, a first name, father name and a family name. So you normally see, uh, I, I would offer, uh, call myself Sachin Surendra Nirale or for that matter, Chanel would be Chanel Sachin Nirale. Uh, in South or, or, or in Christians, pe people have two names, a first name and a family name. In Malayalam, on Tamil, you will see a person as a first name followed by the husband or father's name as the last name. Now, similarly, Paul as a Roman citizen would have had three names. Interesting. First is Prionomen, that is the first name or given name. Nomen Gens, that is principal name. And Cognomen, that is additional name. And often it is denoted by a branch or a branch of a family. Now, a Roman cognomen acted as a surname. And in Apostle's case, this was the Latin Paulus, which is Greek is Paulos, which identified him as a member of Pauli family. Now, he was also known as Saul or Greek Saulos, a transliteration of the Semitic Shoal as we read in Acts chapter 7, 8 and 13. Now, the name, this name uh, Saul was likely his supernomen, that is additional personal name. It's a kind of nickname which was chiefly uh, used with Jews. Yeah. Now, the book of Acts says Paul is a Roman citizen from Tarsus in the province of Cilicia in Eastern Asia Minor. Now, how did he become a citizen? There are two main possibilities. First, Paul's grandparents may have been taken captive when the Roman general Pompey came through Judea in the year 60 BC. And then they were probably sold as a slaves to a Roman citizen. And then as it was common, they were freed after the term of their reliable service. Now, when the slaves are freed, the ex-slaves, they are considered as a part of the extended family and they become a citizen. So that's number one possibility. Another possibility is that the, another path to citizenship could have been the reliable service in making tents for the army. Now, after the victory, the general often feel generous and reward the people with the citizenship. So perhaps Paul's parents were rewarded in this way. Now, Paul in either way, could have been born as a citizen, Roman citizen. Now, however, his citizenship apparently did not affect his theology or his letters. Now, let's see about the Tarsus, where he was from. Now, they say Tarsus it was no ordinary city. Lying 30 miles to the south of the pass through the Taurus mountains, called the Sicilian gates along the great Sicilian road, as you can see, which crossed the southern section of Asia Minor. Now, Tarsus was a prosperous city and it was also known for its intellectualism and education were its major distinctions. Now, the inhabitants of Tar Tarsus were so well known for learning. Now, you would often see that Pune is called as Oxford of East, correct? Similarly, was Tarsus so known for uh, its, its learning that the gentleman Strabo, the Roman geographer, uh, geographer, he said, the people at Tarsus have devoted themselves so eagerly, not only to philosophy, but also to the whole round of education in general, that they have surpassed Athens, Alexandria or any other place. Now, however, Strabo also continues to say that the inhabitants who study in Tarsus complete their education abroad. So see, that time also people used to go for a post-graduation somewhere else. So Saul followed this pattern by studying in Jerusalem under the Rabbi Gamaliel, who was the grandson of the famous uh, Rabbi uh, Hillel as we read in Acts chapter 22. Now, Strabo also make a special point, note, that 
that the schools of rhetoric in Tarsus, he make a note of uh, schools of uh, rhetorics in Tarsus. And Paul's letters evidence his familiarity with the ancient rhetorical discourse. Now, although he received rigorous training in Torah, he could have also read uh, other uh, literature like Homer, uh, Eurifides, and other literatures without the fear of incurring uncleanliness or ritual defilement. At that time, if you, if they were referring something else, it were it, it were there was a fear that uh, a person would become unclean. Yeah. So without even that, he could have also referred to other Greek literature. Now, more important for Paul was that he was in a Greek culture. So his letters are in Greek and often reflect Greek rhetorical techniques. Now, Paul's letter reflect a person who was well educated, well enough to construct a detailed argument in Greek. That's important. Now, Paul's letter also reflect a knowledge of Greek religions. He uses the terminology of mystery religions, for example, and adapt it for teaching truth about Christ. Some of his uses of pagan terminology might have been initiated by his opponents or his readers, but Paul may have initiated some of it himself. Like in Acts 17 reports him using Greeks poets and ideas when speaking in Athens. He was able to take something from their culture and use it for the gospel. So next now we will see what was the influence of Judaism on Paul. Now the most important background for understanding Paul is probably Judaism. He was Jewish by birth and by training because in the book of Philippines, uh, in his letters to Philippines in chapter 3 verse 5, Paul says he was a Hebrew of he, Hebrew of the Hebrews, which suggests that he spoke Aramaic like a native, which also implies that he would have lived in Judea at an early age. His letters include more than 100 quotes of the Old Testament and Judaism is discussed in his, uh, also discussed in his letters. Now, there was a diversity in the Jewish belief, but some beliefs were widespread. And I think I covered this before also. So the Jewish beliefs that were widespread, other people knew is that monotheism, one God, respect for Torah, including the rules about food or Sabbath or circumcision, their ties with uh, Moses, uh, the Jewish people and the temple in Jerusalem and their hope for divine intervention. Now, this belief can be summarized as just four words is God, Israel, Torah and hope. Now, God had given people his law as a favor to them. It was given by grace, but it was then people's duty to keep the law. So religion then was a matter of what person did, not what they believed. Now let's see uh, more about persecution. Now Luke says that Paul was trained by Gamaliel, but Paul does not mention this in his letters. Now as a person, he was more zealous than his teacher. The Talmud says that Gamaliel was more liberal school of Hillel. And so, but if you see Paul's zeal to uh, persecute seems to reflect that the strictness of the school of Shammai, because he was more zealous than most of the Pharisees, as we read it in Galatians chapter 1 and uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3. Now, uh, about this zeal, let's, uh, let's uh, dwell a little back. Jewish history has a couple of figures who had willingness to kill other Jews due to this zeal. We see in Numbers chapter 25, Phineas, the grandson of Aaron, was angry when an Israelite man took a Moabite woman into his tent, perhaps as a sign of marriage. Now, even after Moses told people not to do it, so Phineas killed them both and God said, Phineas has turned my anger away from the Israelites, for he 
was as zealous as I am for my honor among them. He made atonement for the Israelites in Numbers chapter 11 uh, to 13. Now, also during the intertestamental times between the Old Testament and New Testaments, we see in the book of Maccabees, a priest named Matthias. He killed people who compromised by sacrificing to a pagan god. When Matthias, Matthias saw it, he burned with zeal and gave vent to righteous anger. He ran and killed him on the altar. Thus he burned with zeal for the law just as Phineas did as noted in uh, Maccabees chapter, uh, 1st Maccabees in chapter 2 verse 23 to 26. Now here the concern seem not to be just for people breaking the law. Lots of Jews broke the law but for influencing others to break the law in an intentional way, blatantly rejecting the covenant the nation had with God. They thought it was better to kill a deviant Jew than to watch the nation slide away from God. Now use this as a background and see Paul's zealous nature when he was persecuting. Now, let's see why was Paul so opposed to the Christians. Now, it was not blasphemous to call someone the Messiah and the Pharisees also did not object to the idea of resurrection of the dead or the reign of God. So what was it about that this Jesus people that made Paul so angry? You know, the first thing is that because they taught a crucified Messiah. A person who died an accursed death, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23, yet was proclaimed to be at the right hand of God. Now, Paul calls this idea of crucified Messiah scandalous. So, we read it in Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. And perhaps he had considered it also blasphemous. Now, the early Christian confession that Christ died for our sins in 1 Corinthians 5.13 and this may have also been considered a blasphemous idea that a cursed criminal had any atoning value because only God can forgive sins and probably a widespread believed but Christians were giving Jesus that role. A second thing would be that people were weakening the importance of the law of Moses. Now, Stephen uh, downplayed the importance of the temple as we read it in Acts Ac chapter 7, which could call into question all the temple related laws and rituals. Now, if Christ is now in heaven and he died for our sins, then that would imply that the temple rituals were not needed. Stephen was accused of teaching against the law. He was attacking some of the belief that kept Israel distinct as a nation, paving the way for the whole nation to slide. And so did Saul into apostasy and divine punishment. That was what they were thinking and they were going on persecution. Now let's see the influence of Christianity on Paul. Now Paul did not have a background in Christianity. But early Christianity still affected his life and his preaching. Now Paul distanced himself from the apostles and note that he was not taught by the apostles. We read it in Galatians chapter 1. To also note that in Galatians, what Paul is trying to show that he is not dependent on the apostles in particular. He does not say that he learned everything by direct revelation and absolutely nothing from humans. He does not say that. Surely, Ananias and the other Christians in Damascus told him as much as they could. Paul says that he received the typical word for handing down a tradition. He says that he received the message of the early church as we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3. So, he would have also known something about the teaching of the people he persecuted because that's why he was persecuting them. So he would have known more about these Christians from the people he was persecuting. 
the fact that jesus appeared to paul implied not just that jesus had been resurrected but also that the church main claim about jesus was true that he was exalted to the highest place in heaven paul would therefore be likely to accept the church other claims about jesus as well that he was the messiah and that he had died for people's sin paul says that he soon began preaching the faith he tried to persecute he knew its doctrine well enough to teach them now paul's experience was not only a conversion no it was also a call a commission to a special job now paul's experience fall into the general pattern of the old testament prophet now what is to happen in old testament they typically see something they are called by uh, by a name twice they respond and then they are given a revelation and something to do for example moses saw the burning bush called by his name twice spoke to god and god told him what to do i think luke uh, reports a similar pattern for paul luke gives three versions of the experience emphasizing that paul was told to go to the gentiles now paul's letters do not tell us that jesus said to him however it is interesting to consider how much paul would have understood simply from seeing the resurrected jesus now he may have thought to himself uh, and, and and it's a uh, his thought i'm reading it out okay what the author has said in my zeal for the law i was unwittingly persecuting someone who has god's approval that made me an enemy of god and yet he forgave me and commissioned me for this service i did not deserve this mercy so it is apparent that god accept me and others by grace not by works he goes on to think i persecuted people unjustly because what they were saying about jesus and jesus is the one who gave me grace if zeal for the law produced in me the sin of persecution then there is something seriously wrong with my attitude about the law further if jesus is the messiah the anointed of god then the salvation he brought is not a national and physical blessing for juda alone but a spiritual one that is not based on israel national covenant with god it is universal now logically this could be explained in a few minutes but psychologically it would take a lot longer to reorient a person self concept and understanding of who god is and what he wants just the fact that jesus as a divine agent was willing to be crucified has enormous implication about god's love and glory now if paul accepted the preaching of the early church that jesus died for our sins then that means the atonement was find found in jesus not in the temple rituals those rituals were not needed any more so the sinai covenant must have been temporary gentiles need not need to come to jerusalem to be taught the law they need to come to christ to be given the spirit this is a fundamental change in the way god is working now let's see a brief chronology of apostle paul's life now assembling a chronology of paul's life is not a easy task since we do not have the full account of his early years nor do the new testament doctrines include much information about his travel between the first and the second imprisonment in rome moreover events mentioned in his letters are sometimes not recounted in the book of acts uh, nevertheless we can reconstruct many of the details of his life let's see how that is so yeah so if you can see there are four columns the first two column uh, is the approximate dates in ad about apostle paul's lifetime from his birth until his martyrdom in ad 68 on the right side you see uh, when he supposedly wrote those epistles 
and we can see that the journey started with Galatians and until 2 Timothy, approximately just before his martyrdom in AD 68. So that's the brief chronology about Apostle Paul's life. Now, next go next to the foundational ideas for Paul. What was his starting point? Now, Paul's starting point is a belief in the unity of God, the Shema. The Jewish confession, Israelite repeated every morning and evening is Apostle Paul's foundation. What was that? Here, that is Shema. O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Paul echoes the Shema in his letters such as his statement that God wants all people to be saved and come to know the truth. For there is one God, as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5. The claim that God is one means for Paul that there is one Savior for all humanity. In a world awash with religious pluralism, Paul boldly declares, what does he say? For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, yet for us there is but one God, the Father from whom all things came and for whom we live. Now Paul understand the worship of idols. The creation of human hands as the central source of sin since human reject the revelation of one God and worship and serve uh, that which is created rather than the creator. Let me repeat. Paul understand the worship of idols, which is the creation of human hands as the central source of sin. Since human reject the revelation of one God and worship and serve that which is created rather than the creator. He says in Romans chapter 1 between 18 to 25. His proclamation of the gospel among the Gentiles therefore begins with a call to abandon idols. Yeah, his proclamation to the gospel, a proclamation of the gospel among the Gentiles, therefore, starts with the call to abandon idols in the favor of one God of all. Paul refuses to give traditional religions a place alongside the gospel. While respectful and no blasphemer of other religions, he does not recognize them as a source of salvation. That's all starting point. Then the second thing is, the second thing of his foundation is Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now among the Gentiles, Paul's announcement that Jesus is Christ or Messiah would not have been readily understood because Paul's central proclamation among them was Jesus Christ is Lord. Now Lord was commonly recognized as a title for both deities and ruler as the part of imperial cult. Now this Christian proclamation directly challenged the other claims to lordship. The Gentiles know Lord. And this proclamation directly challenged those other claims of lordship. Paul writes to Corinthians that while there are many called lords, in fact there is one but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live in 1st Corinthians chapter 8 verse 6. In a similar way, Paul proclaimed that Jesus is Savior and this title likewise Jesus with God. Now, given Paul's liberal use of the title Lord and Savior for Jesus Christ, we are not surprised to hear him called Jesus as God. In Titus chapter 2 verse 13, Paul speak of the blessed hope that is the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Similarly, in Romans chapter uh, 9 verse 5, he speaks, the Messiah who is God over all forever praised. Amen. The exalted status of Christ is so high that Paul describes him as the one who brought the world into existence 
and the one through whom the creation exists. He exercised authority, Jesus exercised authority over all as Lord, as we read in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, and also a reference to Psalm 110, verse 1. Now, Paul's high Christology contrasts sharply with modern attempt. Nowadays, people are attempting to reduce Jesus as nothing but a moral teacher or a traveling sage or a cultural ideal. For Paul, Christ was much more than that. And the third foundation for Paul, uh, as he was uh, preaching to the Gentiles, is the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, for Paul, the crucifixion of Jesus was a sacrifice for the sins of humanity. The death for sin fulfilled the promise of ancient scriptures that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now, during Paul's time, Jewish theology did not understand Isaiah 53 as a messianic prophecy. Because to preach Christ crucified was a patent contradiction. How could the promised Messiah be subject to such a shameful treatment? Paul's challenge in the synagogue, therefore, was to show the scripture that the Messiah had to suffer, as we read in Acts chapter 17, verse 3. The message of the cross was likewise difficult for Gentiles to accept. As Paul acknowledged, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 23. To preach that a crucified Jew was a crucified Jew was a savior and Lord would have been hard to accept by the Gentiles. Moreover, crucifixion was the ultimate torture. Apostle Paul states, to whom, to those whom God has called both Jews and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul saw Christ's death through the sacrificial system of the temple in Jerusalem. He declares to Corinthians that Christ, a Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. His death is a sacrificial atonement that turned away God's wrath in Romans 3.25. The repeated reference to Christ's blood returns us to a sacrificial nature of Christ's death since that was that blood was poured out in death for sin as we read it in first corinthians 11 25 ephesians 1 7 and colossians 1 20. the significance of christ's death does not end however at the cross it's a twin theme is the resurrection when jesus life is vindicated by god let me repeat, the significance of Christ's death does not end, however, at the cross. Its twin theme is the resurrection, when Jesus' life is vindicated by God. On this journey to Damascus, Paul saw the risen Christ and proclaimed that Jesus was truly alive, as Acts 25, 19. His understanding of the resurrection was also rooted in the prophetic testimony that Christ would be raised as he says he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Now let's reflect on some of the terminology that we see and the first terminology that we see is Paul the Apostle. Now Paul repeatedly identified himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus who attributes his apostleship to an act of God. God called him directly to this service, to the apostle, he is to the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, what was an apostle? Now, in the secular Greek, apostolos describe a messenger, describe a messenger sent on a mission. But the New Testament concept of apostle appears indebted to the Hebrew concept of shaliak. Now, in those days, there were no faxes, telephone or emails. Now, leaders need to authorize the messenger to sign contract and make business arrangements that were binding to the sender. Now, the Mishnah teaches 
that a man's shila that is a messenger is like a man himself and that is why if you remember seeing some of the old uh, movies uh, during the english empire or back during then you would see a messenger would carry the flag and he would open the tree and see and that gave him an authority that he was speaking on behalf of the king and that is how uh, the mishnah also says the man's messenger is like the man himself so paul the messenger of god is representing jesus himself now the second term that we see is christians now the new testament uses various terms to describe the followers of jesus we see believers in first thessalonians saints or holy people in philippians nazaren sect disciples followers of the way in acts but christians however was not a self designation of the believers it was not something the believers gave it to them the name identified them as partisans of christ similar to the herodians and early on the name took on a contempt sense it took on a contempt sense the roman historian uh, tacitus commenting on the persecution under nero's reign he ridiculed the believers as people whom the crowd styled christians he ridiculed the believers as the crowd styled christians and that's why we are not surprised when paul urges uh, peter urges in first peter chapter 4 verse 16 when he says however if you suffer as a christian do not be ashamed but praise god that you bear his name from the earliest time the term believer was not honored it was a source of shame within the society now uh, that's all from our today's session from uh, from apostle paul's his life his background his influence of uh, influence of judaism uh, and christianity on his life and in his ministry now in the next session we are going to see now know that now that we know apostle paul better uh, his background now next uh, time i would like to take about his paul's letters or epistles now a big thank to our references without them i could not have been able to bring such a uh, depth uh, information about apostle paul uh, for me it was so difficult but thanks to this book that gave me a structure which uh, i was able to put together and share with you so that's all from my side today uh, i we would now go into any comments or any doubts that i can clarify Then let me give you yes, Ramati. You are on mute. Can you just unmute? I request you to send yes. me the table table on the chronology of Paul's life. Okay, I will on WhatsApp. Yeah, sure. Okay, let me turn the question into something else. Can you share an additional information about Paul, Apostle Paul, which I couldn't, which I could not cover here? Uh, maybe that would just put uh, add some more information, and then we can get you all into talking or comments about uh, today's uh, things that we cover. It was nice to know that uh, there was a, a liberal school. Gamaliel belonged to a liberal school, <laughs> and Paul belonged to the Republicans. I think he belonged. <laughs> <laughs> he oh. belonged. To the... <laughs> um, you also mentioned that uh, uh, Paul uh, was very zealous, and hence went after people. 
and and literally killed them. Uh, so he was attacking backsliding Jews, taking the example from Old Testament. He was not attacking non non Jews. It seemed like that. Okay, I see Praveen, this thing. Praveen, you can also share. When I say attacking, yeah. I'm saying he's killing. Non yeah. or, or was he? I don't know <laughs> what the history says. Was it only Jews that he was killing who were backsliding or also the non... Like it was almost like a form of jihad. <laughs> it appears so, but I think we need to do more study about uh, his persecution principle, we know, but who were the subject. But I saw... Uh, Praveen nodding the head. So maybe you can add uh, some more uh, information that we can learn now. Uh, no, not much. I was just uh, thinking about the question only. Actually, Paul was uh, authorized to buy the Sanhedrin to, you know, to take charge of uh, these, um, what we call, uh, as you said, apostate uh, Jews, Jews actually. Who have who have turned up to Christianity, and uh, no way he he has authority of the Sanhedrin. That means they can uh, that authority works only in the Jewish uh, Jewish groups only. It doesn't work among the Gentiles. And another thing is, if it works among the Gentiles, that is entirely against uh, the Roman Republic, uh, because that becomes a crime. Uh, without uh, they uh, without Roman's permission, they cannot. They, he is not a soldier to uh, to get, get involved into any of such uh, projects now with this information just imagine in an until ad uh, I, I this semester i'm taking church history so it started so uh, what i learned is until ad 70 the the division between the jews and the christian which involved jews christian and gentile christian mm -hmm was so deep now you imagine here uh, when during the uh, when uh, apostle paul was persecuting so jews had first the backsliding jews correct so the, the who became christian then the, the the christian jews versus the gentile christians were also sorry the jews versus the so they had one one level persecution here then the second was also from the jews to the entire christians so it must have been a very challenging time that time to practice Christianity. That's what uh, they used to say in the beginning of um, uh, church. The Christians were persecuted by Jews, not by the Romans, because Romans considered them as part of uh, one of the Jewish sects. So later Christianity by itself, uh, it separated itself from both, I mean, from Judaism. That's when the persecution started and it has become illegal. Otherwise, uh, uh, under the Jewish name as part of sex, they could practice their religion. So, yeah, that uh, related to what you have uh, just said. Uh, I appreciate, I was just uh, reading the information how Paul became a, uh, a Roman citizen. You added another um, extra information to it and uh, I, I appreciate that. Is there any third reason? Is there available also? It can be uh, purchased. It can be purchased. It can be uh, <coughs> like uh, slaves are born of like, you know, somebody who worked when Romans and all were coming, they were making alliance. While they were making alliance, there are various families who joined Roman gov government governance and as well as it started with actually with uh, Babylonian captivity. Since then, uh, various empires, they started following the methods of Babylon, which is making use of the wise and uh, educated people of the nation who are subjected. So it is also possible Romans uh, might have appointed some of the Paul's family members uh, as some government officials because of their education and these matters. So that is the very reason Apostle Paul also was into that education background rather than uh, other things. So that is all. these are another possibilities. So they might have purchased or they might have been a bureaucrat, bureaucrats from which they might have got the citizenship. 
Thank you. For me personally, uh, reading the foundation helped me to understand what approach he took towards Gentiles. Now, with, without that foundation, uh, uh, until now when we were reading just the epistle as it is, uh, they would appear more of a approach he took. But why the approach he took, it, it helped me this study to see that, okay, that is why towards Gentile he used the word Lord, that is how this thing and that would be more applicable to them. Some, you know, some theologians even say the usage of the word. He uses uh, the word Jesus Christ only changing the word Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus also based on his audience. Uh, so that's also quite uh, interesting to say. Any other comment, Mr. Poppins, Mr. Om Prakash, Vanessa? No, it's okay for me. Then I think we can conclude our study today. Yeah, and uh, if I may request Pastor Dan to close the prayer and submit rest of the week as we uh, meet on Sunday in prayers. Let's pray. Gracious loving Father, we just thank you for this blessing of being able to be educated and increased in our knowledge. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the resources that you have provided, that we get such rich information about the scriptures, the Bible. It uh, makes the Bible so much more real, and uh, indeed our faith is increased. Thank you, Lord, for blessing our church with such wonderful information, and I'm grateful for uh, Sachin and Praveen taking these courses, which uh, brings rich information to all of us. So thank you, Lord, and uh, we are grateful to you for another evening. We pray for your blessings upon this evening, and certainly the week as we look forward to another time and we can come together and worship you. Thank you for all your love and uh, your care for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.